Back in June, DevComp CZ took place in the Czech Republic. And honestly, I don't know how I and seemingly everybody else missed this until like a day ago, but there were some really interesting talks that happened at this event. One in particular that I want to talk about is no more bootloader, please use the kernel instead. This isn't even a matter of the video not being available online until like a day or two ago. It's been up for two weeks. Just nobody realized. This is a talk by a Red Hat employee by the name of, and as always, I apologize for my bad pronunciation, Marta Lewandowska. Whilst the recording here is 34 minutes, the last half is all just questions. It's about 18 minutes long of a talk. But along with this talk, there is also an accompanying blog post, NMBL, Nimble, we don't need a bootloader. When we boot into Linux, conventionally we rely on a bootloader. So when you power on your system, one of the very early things that happens is the UEFI or the BIOS is started. If it's older hardware, it's going to be BIOS. If it's newer hardware, it's going to be UEFI. But in this case, it doesn't really matter. Both of these are then gonna start up the bootloader. Now the responsibility of the bootloader is to start up the kernel with any desired kernel parameters. For example, changing the init system to something like a shell to do something like go and reset a password, along with loading any external init RAMFS images. Now the point of the main init RAMFS is to basically act as a initial file system that gets everything ready to start up your main file system, loading any kernel modules and other things that might need to be loaded to make sure you can actually go to the next step of the boot. Now, any external init RAMFS basically can modify that core init RAMFS without replacing the entire thing. If you want a more in-depth discussion of various other parts of the Linux boot process, a good place to start is the Arch boot process page on the Arch Linux wiki. Whilst it is for Arch, it is going to be relevant for basically every other distro as well. For today though, the only part that we care about is the bootloader. Now traditionally, a lot of distros make use of Grub. Grub is incredibly popular on my system. I am also making use of Grub. More recently though, a lot of distros have been swapping over to something known as systemd boot. Now don't let the name confuse you is not actually part of systemd. It has been adopted into the systemd suite, but basically it's a rebrand of another system called Gummy Boot. But this is becoming a more popular way to do things. However, the main focus of the author here is with Grub. The Grub bootloader is a powerful, flexible, fully featured bootloader that is used on multiple architectures and is able to one, initialize a variety of peripherals, two, read files from complex storage devices, three, access and boot over a network, four, support a wide range of file systems and volume types, among other things. Unfortunately, these features create complexity that is difficult to maintain and both duplicates and lags behind the Linux kernel while also creating numerous security holes. The Linux kernel has a much larger developer base, which results in faster feature development, quicker response to vulnerabilities, and greater overall scrutiny. And all software out there is going to have security vulnerabilities, but there are quite a few recent examples that exist in Grub. Some of them range from being not that severe, like low severity, maybe some mediums, Others are fairly high severity and very important to make sure they actually are resolved. Again, it's not the fault of software that vulnerabilities exist. Vulnerabilities are going to exist in every piece of software. But when you have a code base that more people are looking at, that more people are developing, you're going to have more opportunities to actually deal with those problems. Now, how do you deal with the problem of not wanting to have a bootloader? Well, our solution is to use the Linux kernel as its own bootloader, loaded by the FE stub on UEFI and packed into a unified kernel image, UKI. The kernel, init RAMFS, and kernel command line contain everything they need to reach the final boot target, all necessary drivers, file system support, and networking are already built in and code duplication is avoided. 
Now, this is not an entirely new concept. It is building on existing tech. Booting with an EFI stub on UEFI using a unified kernel image. These are things you can already do. And better support for unified kernel images is being worked on in distros like Fedora. But what is a unified kernel image? From the unified kernel image spec, a unified kernel image, UKI, is a combination of a UEFI boot stub program, a Linux kernel image, an optional init RD, and further resources in a single UEFI PE file. This file can either be directly invoked by the UEFI firmware, which is useful in particular in some cloud slash confidential computing environments, or through a bootloader, which is generally useful to allow multiple kernel versions with interactive or automatic selection of version to boot into. Okay, so it's a way to boot directly with a kernel. But what is a UEFI boot stub then? This is the thing that allows you to actually do that direct booting. The Linux kernel supports EFI stub booting, which allows EFI firmware to load the kernel as an EFI executable, completely skipping the step of needing a bootloader. So booting a kernel directly is not a new idea in and of itself. The better way to think of Nimble isn't necessarily as a new bit of tech itself. Better to look at it as like a name for the tech stack. With Nimble, there is two ways that booting is done. Firstly is the simpler case, Nimble Reduction. This is the switch root case. Then we have the more complex one, the Nimble case. This is the k-exec path. The author thinks that most users and most distros are going to want to go with the simpler case, but the more complex one is here for a good reason. Okay, so we start with the UEFI, which loads up the secure boot shim. This is because we want secure boot working. Personally, I don't use it. I know there are a lot of users and a lot of distros that do make use of secure boot, and it's probably a good idea to use it, and you want secure boot to keep working. Okay, so secure boot, working. Then we can go and load the unified kernel image, which has that FE stub inside of it. And basically the UEFI just starts it up directly. And there you go, now you're booted into Linux. You skip all of the whole bootloader stuff, and it's just good. This is nothing new though. In my mind, the Nimble case is a lot more interesting. This is a case where you have multiple kernels installed, or multiple operating systems installed, and you want to be able to switch between them. This is what allows you to do so. Once again, we start in the UEFI, this loads up the secure boot shim, and then loads up the kernel directly. Because we are not using an external bootloader, this time we're going to use the kernel as a bootloader. The kernel can then load into user space, and then this is going to load up a bootloader-like menu currently being done with grubemu, basically a grub menu emulator. From here, we can then select the kernel we want to use, and then we can use the kexec function to swap from the current kernel we're running to another kernel. This is not something they developed. Kexec has existed for a very long time. Most of you just never have interacted with it because most people just don't have a reason to swap from one running kernel over to another one. So once we've kexec into the kernel we actually want to open, then the kernel that we actually want to be using, that one is now running, and that can go into user space and now we've booted just fine. Now, besides just getting rid of Rub, there are some other anticipated advantages here. Firstly, improve boot time. If there is not a menu in the process of booting, if there is not another thing in that boot chain, you're going to boot quicker. That's just naturally how it works. Faster feature delivery. Since kernel and bootloader code will no longer have to be duplicated, features will only have to be implemented once to be available in both places. Decreased maintenance burden, because you're only implementing things in one place and there's less duplicated work, it's easier to maintain that work. Increased security. Packing the kernel and NITRAMFS and kernel command line into a UKI and signing the composite binary will considerably increase security. At present, the unsigned NITRAMFS presents the largest security hole in the secure boot process. Now, if you were never using secure boot in the first place, you probably don't really care about this. But if we are talking about an enterprise context where security 
at least matters on paper. Whether it gets implemented properly is another question, but at least matters on paper. You want to make sure your secure boot is actually secure and there's not a giant gaping hole where you can just inject things into the process without anything checking it. And possibility to chain load from Linux while using secure slash trusted boot. Dual booting, although not supported on RHEL, is important for Fedora. And while there are attempts to k-exec any PE binary, our plan is to set boot next and then reset, which will preserve the chain of trust that originates in firmware while not interfering with other bootloaders. Okay. What is boot next? The way that I understand it is it tells the system to reboot and then boot into another operating system. So this is happening after we're in this secure boot environment. We've gone through the shim. We know that we have this nice chain of trust going on. So we can go from being on Linux over to this other operating system, knowing that everything is still in this secure environment. Again, if you don't care about secure boot, doesn't really matter to you. But if you are in an enterprise environment, doing things safely is what you should be doing. Now, I do have some concerns with using a system like this. If you are using another kernel to boot into your later kernel, if there is something wrong with this kernel, for whatever reason it's not booting, maybe you had a corrupted download when you updated or something like that, you can be in a position where, because this kernel is broken, you can no longer boot into this later kernel. Obviously, there's going to be ways to fix this, live CDs and all that sort of stuff that you'd normally have to do. But my point is, when things go a little bit wrong with the kernel, they will be going exceptionally wrong. Is it often a problem like this is going to happen? No. But the reason you keep multiple kernels around is on those cases where something does go wrong, it's easy to swap into something else and know that you can easily do so. This is an interesting approach to booting. I don't know if it's going to be something that every single distro adopts. I think the bootloader is going to be something that sticks around long into the future. But I do think there are cases where doing an approach like this, and people already are doing Effie stub booting anyway, doing an approach like this does make more sense. But what do you think? Let me know. Do you do an Effie stub boot? Do you like the idea of basically having a temporary kernel that opens a menu that lets you open up another kernel and completely eliminating the bootloader from the process? I would like to know. So if you liked the video, go like the video. And if you really liked the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, Scribes, and Libero Pay linked in the description down below. That's going to be it for me, and I'm rebooting.